CYC is a free channel presents the Word of God for everyone. Your support will help us to continue the mission. Visit our website, cycnow.com. Even a dollar will make a difference. Now we'll begin with the bulk of uh, our discussion. What does the word science mean? Now this is now we talked about the academic part of science. I'd like to bring it into the practical, apologetic, and spiritual. Um, I know Sayyidna in the past he advised me to augment the discussions with the Bible, you know, biblical references and so on and so forth. So I I wanted to do that uh, uh, today. What does the word science mean? I'll give you a clue. Omniscience, omniscience. What does the word science mean? Knowledge, right? Knowledge, science. In Latin, scientia means knowledge. Sci the word science means knowledge. Okay, that's what the word means. You can look it up. So science means knowledge, and I want to talk to you about knowledge. Now I want to talk to you, and I want to also caution you about the concept of knowledge. What's the importance of knowledge? Is it important to have knowledge? No one can deny that. The scriptures is filled with verses about the importance of knowledge, the knowledge of God's will, the knowledge of, uh, the knowledge of God, and knowledge is important. And the book of Proverbs talk about, talks about knowledge extensively. My people are foolish, they have not known me, they are silly children, and they have not, no understanding, they are wise to do, they are wise to do evil, but to do good. They have no knowledge. It means that I have to have knowledge to do good, right? Therefore, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And I think somewhere else it says, my people have perished for lack of knowledge. It is not good for a soul to be without knowledge. So we can go on and on and on. It's important to have knowledge. And the importance of knowledge is that knowledge in and of itself is not the end, it's means to an end, right? What's the end to knowledge? For the, your knowledge to become what? Hmm? Ex knowledge of God, but as far as your, your conduct is, is concerned, your knowledge must be fruitful. You can't, you have to act upon that knowledge. You cannot just be a, um, a hard drive of information without really doing anything. I mean, the computer is very knowledgeable but it doesn't do anything with this knowledge. Okay. So knowledge must yield fruit, okay? Oh, this is the, still the importance of knowledge, okay. Uh, many verses about the importance of knowledge. Here's the verse, Hosea 4. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. St. Paul says in Colossians, I do not cease to pray for you that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and so on and so forth. By the way, I don't want to get into the details, but sometimes you see knowledge, knowledge, and knowledge. In Greek, this is translated as gnosis, but when it comes to the knowledge of God or His will, it's epignosis, and the difference is that this is just partial knowledge. When it comes to the knowledge of God, it's full knowledge. So epignosis is full knowledge, gnosis is partial knowledge, but that's just the etymology of the word itself in Greek. But the importance of knowledge, knowledge must bear fruit. Theology, and spirituality, I also don't want to say they're enemies, but they're friends, they're allies. Your theology must be translated into spirituality. Theology deals with the who and why. Spirituality or conduct deals with the do and be. You cannot just learn about the who and why without the do and be. So theology, one Christian author one time said, your theology must be translated into biography. You see, your theology must be translated into biography. In other words, conduct and lifestyle, i.e. fruit, okay? No separation between the mind that knows God and the heart that loves Him. There's no separation, okay? Um, and the church fathers were both theologians filled with knowledge and also saints. There's no separation between the two. And I will build, I will, I'll get to my point in a second. And I'll tell you some more, one more thing about St. Paul's 
um, style of, of preaching, and it's um, very, very interesting. This is his method of preaching the faith. He begins most of his epistles with what? Doctrine, theology, and at the end, the conduct, the practicality. It's almost, it is so uh, uh, vivid. Listen to this, Romans. 11 chapters about doctrine, the doctrine of baptism, sanctification, redemption, salvation, and all that. And then chapter 12, therefore, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So chapter 12 begins with therefore. In Ephesians, three chapters about doctrine and dogma. Chapter 4, 1, therefore, walk worthy according to the walk, to the calling that you were called. Galatians, first four chapters, doctrine. Then first, chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, and he talks about freedom in Christ and liberty in Christ. Philippians, same thing, first chapter, this is theology, second chapter, therefore, and so on and so forth. Colossians, therefore, it's almost as if St. Paul has this template in his mind. I'll give you the doctrine, but doctrine and knowledge is useless unless I give you the, I call it the therefore of St. Paul. Notice how many therefores he has in his epistles. You'll be amazed how he explained. This is, um, this is called a priori um, philosophical arguments. And he's obviously he's a philosopher, great philosopher. So he uses philosophy and arguments to give you the foundation, and then you can build upon it. You give you the theology, and you can build. So needless to say, knowledge is important and must have fruit. However, the seed of knowledge not only must yield fruit, but must have good soil. And that's what I want to focus on, good soil. So not only the after the fact, but before the fact. So knowledge is kind of uh, sheltered between the after and the before. What do I mean by having good soil? Are there any prerequisites to knowledge? For it to bear fruit, you have to have soil. Let me give you some verses. Oops. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Wait a minute. So uh, do I have to have a prerequisite for knowledge? Yes, I do. The fear of the Lord. That's my soil. Remember the parable of the, the sower? He went to a... What, what's the difference? The different, the different soils? You have to have that soil before you throw in the seed of knowledge. And I will, I will loop that back to science and Christianity, or knowledge and Christianity, but I, bear, with me, um, bear with me for the moment. Listen to this, Proverbs 12.1. Whoever loves instructions, loves knowledge. What does that imply? What does that mean? Whoever is what? Meaning? Waiting, yeah, and, and as a virtue, what, what virtue is this? Willing to, learn. Willing to learn is what virtue? Humility. Humility. So that is the soil that one must have before he builds upon it knowledge. Go back to the scientists that used science and discovered that God exists through their use of science they had the right soil. And those scientists that used science against God had different type of soil. Different type of soil. Neither did they, they did not love instructions, neither did they have the fear of the Lord. Now listen to what St. Peter says in 2 Peter 1.5. Add to your faith, what? Virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. What's added to what? Do you get that? Knowledge is actually added to virtue. What's the prerequisite to knowledge? Virtue. And then with knowledge, you'll become more virtuous. But you have to have virtue before you add knowledge. And with knowledge, you become more virtuous and you have that circle. But there is a prerequisite to having knowledge. The reason why I'm saying this to you, my friends, is that we now live in the age of knowledge. You have questions. I think one of the news stations in, in uh, California, I don't know if it's here too, is they, they, their slogan is, you have questions, we have answers. Channel 5, we ha you have questions, we have answers. Any of you have questions, we have Google. It's, there is no shortage of knowledge, is there? 
As a matter of fact, um, one of the problems of this outburst of technology is that that affects parenting. Children nowadays have lost not the dignity of their parents, but the, uh, the, the ability to go, go to their parents and ask for information. Because why would I go to mom and dad and ask for information when I can just look it up? You see? I have knowledge accessible to me. But knowledge without virtue and wisdom is very, very dangerous. And that's why it's a caution. Sometimes we may claim to be, ah, oh, you know, I read a book about this and this. I became an expert in this. Uh, I'm a scientist. I can do... Humble yourself, till your soil, so that knowledge, when it, the seed of knowledge, when it falls on this virtuous soil, it will eventually yield what? Fruit. Okay. Knowledge without the soil of humility is this. Isaiah 47.10 Your wisdom, listen to this, your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you, and you have said in your heart, I am, and there's no one else besides me. That's knowledge, not according to humility. Have warped you. In other words, that your knowledge actually became your, your enemy because you said, I am he, because you don't have any humility. St. Paul said a very interesting verse about knowledge. He says, knowledge does what? Puffs up. There you go. What kind of... You just said that knowledge is good. Yeah, but there's knowledge with what? Good soil that the seed had fallen on, that gives you fruit and that you need to do and work on and all that, but their knowledge without the good soil of humility and love will puff up. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, 3. Now considering these things offered to idols, we know that we have knowledge. We all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies and so on. So my friends, look at this plant. If you need to have a plant that eventually will yield fruit, the fruit of knowledge, this is knowledge. If you want to have the fruit of knowledge, if you want to have the, uh, the spirituality as a result of your theology, or if you want to turn your theology into spirituality, you must till your soil. You must prepare the soil of your heart and the soil of your mind to receive this knowledge. Indispensable to bearing fruit. Isaac Newton, we all know him, he said, in science, it's very profound, I love what he said here, in science we resemble children collecting a few pebbles at the beach of knowledge, while the ocean of the unknown unfolds itself in front of us. We think we have attained uh, the Dawkins of the world, the Hitchens of the world, the Harrises of the world, all the atheists of the world, they think you know, they, they've attained all that could be attained. Yet, Isaac Newton himself said that we're children collecting few pebbles at the beach of knowledge, while the ocean of the unknown is unfolding before us. This is the knowledge that we shouldn't have. A few verses. Woe to you who are wise in their own eyes. The, 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 the scriptures are filled with verses about being wise in your own eyes, and you think that you have attained all that can be attainable. Do not wise be wise in your opinion, and so on and so forth. That's why Christ said, I thank you, Father. It's a beautiful verse, and it sums it up. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, and that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent. Wise and prudent, yes. Wise and prudent, what? In their own eyes. And then you have revealed them to babes. What are babes? Babes are those who are teachable something that we actually don't have much of nowadays. Simple and humble. You see, those things of God can only come to you if you have that soil of teachability, simplicity, and humility. This is the knowledge we shouldn't have. Knowledge is power. The power to make other people feel uh, ignorant or stupid, as it says. This is the knowledge we shouldn't have, but this is the knowledge that our culture and society thrives on. Correct me if I'm wrong. I hear this all the time at work. In the consulting world, as a consultant, you have to be knowledgeable of all the operations of the businesses and so on, so that you can offer consultative values and expertise and, and justify your, your income. 
right? So we always say this, knowledge is power, knowledge is power. Because as a consultant, you need to have knowledge so that you can let your clients know they don't know anything about anything. Make them feel inferior to you. That's what our society thrives on. Am I, am I mistaken? Right? But here's the problem, or here's the issue, not the problem. Knowledge is power. Not power over other people, but knowledge with good soil is actually power over and control over yourself, not over other people. That's why St. Peter says that in the verse, add to virtue knowledge. And when you have knowledge, you will have what? Self-control. That's the knowledge we should seek. The knowledge that will give me self-control, not the knowledge that will give me control over others. That's the knowledge of the world or the wisdom of the world, as St. James says, and the wisdom, the heavenly wisdom that gives me self-control, not control over others. Um, now I want to pause and talk to you about questioning the questioner. Having said that, we always have to look at the intent of the questioner before we can be quick on answering the question. Okay. I'll give you two examples. Who's this? Anyone can tell me who this is? Huh? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And who's, who are these? Pharisees. Pharisees. They asked Christ, both of these folks, or Nicodemus came and asked Christ, although he came at night, yes, maybe the method wasn't very... But he did come and ask Christ some questions. You read this in John chapter 3. And then Christ told him, you have to be born again and all that. And then Nicodemus asked the question, how can this be? And thank God he asked this question, because part of the answer of Christ was the famous verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. So I'm glad the question was asked so that we can get the benefit of this wonderful verse. But he asked the question, what was the intent of his question? It was good. He really wanted to know. So what did Christ do? He answered the question with content with information, with knowledge, there was a good soil in Nicodemus' heart, right? Now, let's look at the other scenario. The Pharisees asked Christ many questions. For example, Jesus, can you please tell me by what authority are you doing these things? Christ could have said, well, by my authority, by the authority of him who sent me. He could have answered the question, but he didn't answer the question. He actually, you know what, the, what, what he said in return? He asked, the question. He, asked the question. he asked them a question. What was the question he asked? Uh, the Very good. Well, let me ask you, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from... And then they, he asked them, a and then they reasoned within themselves, oh, wait a minute, if we say it's from heaven, oh, he's going to say, well, why didn't you believe in it? And if, he's, if we say it's from earth, he was actually John the Baptist was highly regarded people will get upset at us so they said oh, we don't know what did he say well I'm not gonna tell you I mean, he's not playing uh, uh, childish with them but what is the message Christ is sending when he answered Nicodemus's question yet he didn't answer the question it was a question both questions what's the problem what's the difference the intention that's why my friends always remember this intent is prior to content. Intent is prior to content. There is a beautiful saying of George MacDonald, beautiful saying, he says, to give truth to him who loves it not is but to give him multiplied reasons for misinterpretations. To give truth to him who loves it not is but to give him multiplied reasons for misinterpretations. In other words, intent, loving the truth, is prior to content, the truth itself. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. There's another situation with Pilate and Christ that speaks to this, to the intent prior to content. Pilate therefore asked him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, yes, you, 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 you say rightly that I am a king for this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world. Now listen to this, that I should bear witness to what? To the truth. Here is the most important statement in this, in this uh, passage. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. You know what that means? You can also translate this by saying, everyone who is on the side of truth 
hears my voice. Or everyone who's committed to truth hears my voice. In other words, it's not the problem with my voice. It's the problem with whether you are loving and committed to the truth or not. If you have the intent to know the truth, you will get the content of my voice. Do you, do you see how it works? Intent is prior to content, and that's a very important lesson for all of us in this day and age of knowledge and technology and knowing and knowing and knowing. Get your soil ready so that your knowledge can bear fruit. Oh, actually, uh, oh, here it is. George MacDonald. To give truth to him who loves it not is but to give him multiplied reasons for misinterpretations.